God's word hits different. That's the title of this week's message. Because God's word that is preached through the prophet Jonah is about to hit the Ninevites different in chapter three. Here. So we're on page 503, a page that we should be very familiar with in the church Bibles as we've been going through the book of Jonah verse by verse on Wednesday nights. And we're in chapter three. We're in chapter three of the book of Jonah. Let's read chapter three now. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey. And he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. Changes in life can sometimes be difficult. Several of you have probably gone through changes at some point in time in your young life already, such as a move. Maybe your parent gets a job and you have to move states or move cities to be able to go with your family to this new city or state that the Lord has brought you to. Maybe you've changed schools, you've changed friend groups, you've changed sports, you've changed from choir to orchestra. Whatever it is, changes can oftentimes be difficult. And we're seeing this right now with the change in season, are we not? I almost slid out into the middle of the intersection because it didn't stop soon enough at the red light that had quickly befallen me. And it was very, very scary. But winter, the Christmas season, also brings us a lot of good, right? It brings us eggnog. It brings us cookie parties at the Hype House. It brings us ugly, sweaty, sweaty, ugly, sweaty. You guys are sweaty in these things. It brings us ugly sweater parties at youth group next week. Change can also bring some good things, can it not? We see in chapter 3 of the book of Jonah three changes that occur. And yes, that is Rachel Montgomery in the festive Christmas spirit, holding up the tray. Thank you. Appreciate that. But the three changes that we see in Jonah chapter 3 are as follows. First off, we see a change in Jonah's actions in verses 1 through 4. The second change that we see is a change in Nineveh's actions in verses 5 through 9. Thirdly and finally, we see a change in God's actions in verse 10. God changes his mind. What do we do with that? Well, we're not there yet. Let's look at these one by one. First off, we see a change in Jonah's actions in verses one through four. Look at verse one with me here. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. How many of y'all are grateful that God gives you a second chance? That God shows you his grace and his unmerited favor when you have literally flipped him the metaphorical bird? and ran in the exact opposite direction that he called you to go. God freely bestows grace upon his people, of which Jonah is one of. And so the word of the Lord comes to Jonah again. He says, Jonah, I'm giving you a second chance. But the calling is the same. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. 
The last that we saw of Jonah, he'd just gotten spit up onto dry land, and the Lord has now made straight his path before him so that he can go fulfill the calling that God gave him in the first place, right? I bet at this point in the narrative, Jonah is most likely thinking to himself, it is completely pointless to run against the will of God. He probably echoes Paul's sentiment here in Romans chapter 11, when Paul says that the call or the calling of God is irrevocable. It is irreplaceable. It is undoable. When God calls you to do something, it's almost as good as if it were already done. God will accomplish his purpose, either because of you or in spite of you. So Jonah, he's a little more obedient this time around. Maybe a little bit reluctant, but obedient nonetheless. Just like we saw in his prayer last week, the fish vomited him out onto the land because perhaps he might not have been as genuine in his repentance as it looks like at first glance. But yeah, Jonah, he gets up and he continues on his merry way. <laughs> Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. That word can also be rendered, or that phrase can also be rendered. It's an exceedingly great city to God. It's a great city to God. Which means that the city of Nineveh is important to God. Do you know why the city of Nineveh is important to God? Do you think it's because of the big skyscrapers and because of the nice architecture that they have? in the city of Nineveh at that time? Do you think that's why it's important to God? No. The city of Nineveh is important to God because people live there. God cares about the city of Menominee just as much as he cares about the exceedingly great city of Nineveh here. Why? Because people live there. God cares for those who are created in his image. And so he arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Now archaeologists have actually excavated ancient Nineveh, and they've estimated that the city of Nineveh, which is located somewhere in Iran currently, it's only about seven or eight miles around in circumference, for you math folk. Now diameter, circumference. I got a D minus in pre-calc, I swear. Seven to eight miles in circumference, Nineveh was around. That does not seem like a three days journey to me, to walk seven to eight miles. I feel like you could maybe do that in one jogging session for you two. He could maybe do that. You'd probably quit. <laughs> Kidding. But it doesn't seem like a three days journey to me. So a lot of commentators have actually speculated that when it talks about Nineveh being a three days journey, it's talking about Nineveh and the surrounding suburbs, as it were, is a three days journey. Like when somebody goes through Chicago, typically they'll say, I'm going through the Chicago land area, right? I'm driving through the Chicago land area, which includes all the suburbs, like Wheaton, like Glen Ellen, like Elmhurst, like Oak Park. That is more like a three days journey to walk through especially when you're hoofing it in the Air Nazareth sandals, like Jonah probably was. It's an exceedingly great city. It's a great city. It's an important to, city to God, and Jonah is now venturing through it. Now, what's he going to do? Is he going to preach? Is he going to be obedient? Is his message going to be full-hearted or half-hearted? Let's read on here. Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. He doesn't even go through the entire city of Nineveh, which might show something of his reluctant obedience here. He just gives it maybe a half effort. I won't go through the whole city and preach to everybody, but I might just stop in like the city square or something, or stop short of the city square, just so I can say that I went to Nineveh, but I don't actually have to witness to every Ninevite that I pass. He goes a day's journey into the city, verse 4, and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's a pretty simple message of judgment upon these people. 
It's kind of doom or gloom. It's kind of a turn or burn message, if you've ever heard that phrase. Turn from your sins or burn for your sins, if you don't. That's kind of the message that Jonah preaches here. And it's kind of equivalent to what we see a lot of picket signers do on the side of the road, oftentimes. Turn or burn, repent or perish. God is angry all day long at sinners. We've seen these types of signs before. That's the kind of message that Jonah proclaims in Nineveh. And it's funny because in the last part of that verse, he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Overthrown. That word in the Hebrew can also be translated as overturned. Overturned. And the reason that's significant is because Jonah probably thinks that he's crying out against these people a message of judgment. And he doesn't think they're going to repent. And he probably, most likely, thinks that God is going to rain down fiery coals on this city just like he did on Sodom and Gomorrah. All the while, God is actually about to overturn their hearts. He's about to change their hearts within them. Even with this somewhat half-hearted message of judgment that Jonah is preaching to these people, even God will use that. Do you know why God will use his word here, even though Jonah maybe preaches it half-heartedly? It's because God's word is infinitely powerful to break through even the most calloused of hearts, like the Ninevites. Jeremiah chapter 23, God says, Is not my word like fire, which melts even the most callous hearts like these Ninevites? And is not my word like a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces, even in the most callous hearts like mine and like yours? God's word does that. My words don't do that. James' words don't do that. God's word does that. God sends this man, Jonah, into the city to proclaim a very simple message. And God is about to bring about an incredible revival through even this simple message that Jonah proclaims. You're familiar with this verse in Hebrews chapter 4 as well. That the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. This book is alive, beloved. It has veins. It has a pulse. It breathes. It can bring people from death to life. It cuts hearts. And I'm amazed that week after week, we've got like 60 or so Bibles here in this bin just sitting there. And the difference between heaven and hell hinges off whether or not somebody embraces the message in that book. And the books are just sitting there. I'm like, this has the key of eternal life and it's just sitting there. And God says, yeah, that's how I ordained it. My word cuts people. Spiritual flesh wounds are caused by this book. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It cuts people. Just like it did in Acts chapter 2 when Peter preaches his sermon to these Israelites on the day of Pentecost. They hear his sermon. It says when they heard this sermon, they were cut to the heart. They were bleeding internally. Has God ever done that to you during a sermon? Or has God ever done that to you when you're reading your Bible in the quiet, still hours of the morning? And God just hits you different, man. He hits you different. And it's only God that can do that pricking work in your heart. It's as if God takes out a spiritual knife and just plunges it into you. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do in response to this sermon that's just been preached? Do we just sit here? Peter, tell us what next. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Similar message at one level to what Jonah is preaching to these Ninevites. 
repent and believe or perish. That's the gospel message. There has to be some sort of judgment in the gospel message, beloved. You have to tell them their spiritual state and you have to tell them what their spiritual state will be in eternity if they fail to repent. You've got to include that as well. And Jonah seems pretty proficient at that here. But in light of his message, we see the second change. We see a change in Nineveh's actions as well. In verses five through nine, let's look there. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown And the people of Nineveh believed God. They didn't just believe that God existed. They believed that his word was true. Do you take God at his word? Do you believe him when he says you will be more blessed if you turn from sin and pride and lust and idolatry and worship of self? Do you believe him when he says that if you turn from those things, you'll be more blessed than if you don't? Do you take him at his word? It's one thing to believe in God, and it's another thing entirely to believe God and take him at his word. Just like the Ninevites do here. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, which is a sign of mourning and contrition over sorrow, and sorrow for sin. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. From the king in the palace to the peasant on the streets. This revival is citywide. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. I don't care if you're a cow. You drink and you eat nothing. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. This must have looked interesting. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. We saw just how violent these Ninevites were in week one of our study. And that's the first thing that the king says to these people that they must repent of. He takes a shot at sin, number one, A. You must repent from this. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Though God is completely just in his judgments, if he struck us down dead here on the spot, just like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, who knows? God may show us grace and forgive us. God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. I want to ask one question based off of the change in Nineveh's actions here in verses 5 through 9. Namely, why was Nineveh's change so drastic from the king to the peasant? What happened here? It certainly wasn't Jonah's passion, probably, in preaching this message. But yet God brought about a city, country, nationwide revival through this message. Why was their change so drastic? Well, some commentators have speculated that Jonah's skin was actually bleached from the acid inside the stomach of the fish so that people could actually see the marks of God's grace on his hands and his arms and on his face as he preached this turn or burn message to the people of Nineveh. That probably would validate your message a little bit, wouldn't it? You're covered in God's grace over your life when you should be dead. You're actually up on land here now preaching. It'd be pretty convincing. But in the final analysis, the reason there was such a widespread revival in Nineveh in Jonah's time was because God granted Nineveh repentance. He gave them faith. And he allowed them to come to him and embrace him and trust him and love him. That's why anybody comes to faith. 
is if God gives it to you. We learned last week that salvation is of who? You can say it out loud if you want. Salvation is of the Lord. And God grants salvation to these people in Nineveh. Paul gives an interesting word to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 when he's instructing a younger minister in the faith on how to lead a local congregation as he takes up residence in the city of Ephesus. Paul says to Timothy, he says, the Lord's servant, you, Timothy, you must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. I think our boy Jonah probably could have, less, could have learned a lesson from this text here in 2 Timothy 2. He wasn't very gentle, he wasn't very kind, maybe, but yet God still used him. But if you are not quarrelsome, and if you are kind to everyone, and if you are teaching and patiently enduring evil, and correcting your opponents with gentleness, who knows? God may perhaps grant those people that you're proclaiming the gospel to, repentance. He might use your message in such a way that he gives them faith and convicts them of their sin and brings them to himself. God may perhaps grant them repentance, allow repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. God granted repentance to an entire city through like six words. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words. And you don't think God can use your words. The third change that we see here in this text is a change in God's actions, which is particularly interesting in light of the fact that the Bible says that God does not change. God never changes his mind. Malachi chapter 3 says, I, the Lord, do not change. Numbers chapter 23. Actually, before we get there, I want us to learn a word tonight, okay? It's a big word. You've got to put your thinking caps on here to be able to recall the word and remember this word and what it means. It's an important word because it relates to who God is. And the word is immutability. Immutability. This does not mean that you cannot mute your TV when you hit the remote control. That's not what that means. What this word does mean is that something or someone is impossible to change. If they are immutable, they do not change whatsoever. This is one of the attributes that God himself possesses in his person. God is immutable in his character. He doesn't change in his affections or his love. He doesn't change in his wrath or justice ultimately. I, the Lord, do not change. Neither does his will or his plans. His plans are immutable because they change not. Numbers chapter 23 testifies to this. It said that God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? If he speaks something, will he not fulfill it? He spoke in judgment against the Ninevites, but in verse 10 he says, never mind. So my question of God here is, did God change his mind? And go against other verses in scripture that says that he does not change his mind. What in the world is happening here in verse 10? My answer to that question did God change his mind, is yes and no. Yes and no. From our perspective, God did change his mind. If you're the Ninevites, you think that you're going to come under God's just judgment for not repenting, but then you see God turn from that. It seems as if God changed his mind from our perspective. From our perspective, it does seem like God changes his mind on things. From Jonah's perspective, it probably seemed like he changed his mind on some things, even though he wished that this city would have been burned down to an ash heap. 
From our perspective, it looks like God changed his mind because the Bible describes him in such terms so that we can relate and understand God better. But ultimately, from God's perspective, he did not change his mind. God knew from all eternity past that the Ninevites would repent upon the preaching of the prophet Jonah. Isaiah chapter 46, God says, I am God. No kidding. And there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Notice this phrase here. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. He predicts the future. He calls the shot before it happens. From the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. The end from the beginning. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So it must have been God's purpose to have these Ninevites repent. So how do we balance those two? How did God plan the repentance of these Ninevites? Hang with me now. God made up his mind from eternity past that this was the purpose that was going to come to pass in time when Jonah preached to these people. He made up his mind to change his mind from our perspective. He made up his mind to change his mind when Nineveh repented. But this was the plan all And this is exactly in accordance with God's righteous character, by the way. When you repent, you are forgiven of your sins. You have a responsibility in the matter, dear friends. You can't just say, oh man, I'm beyond saving and therefore God must have just predestined me to hell and there's no way I could ever repent and receive his saving grace. You have a responsibility in this matter to turn and to have your heart overturned in faith so that you trust him. You have a responsibility just like these Ninevites did. You don't know the plans of God. You don't know what he's ordained from before the foundation of the world. You worry about you and let God worry about him. This is exactly in accord with God's righteous and forgiving character. Jeremiah chapter 18 says this. God says, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy that nation... If I determine to do this to that city, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, like Nineveh did, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. I will show grace and favor towards them if they turn, even though I pronounced disaster over them earlier. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it and bless it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I intended to do. Church, you guys have a responsibility in your faith. This is not a passive faith that just said, "Ah, God will do it and I have no say in the matter because God is completely sovereign over my life and I don't actually have to exercise my will in this situation. Yes, God is sovereign, but man is responsible as well. Those are not contradictory. Those are complementary notions. I want us to look at verse 4 here in closing. Look at verse 4 with me here. There's something else I want us to notice. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. If God truly wanted to destroy the Ninevites, why doesn't he do it with the snap of his fingers? Why does he give them 40 days to repent? 40 days so that the message spreads around the city of Nineveh so that it goes from peasant to king in the palace. Why doesn't he just strike them dead if he wanted them dead like he said he did? Quite simply, it's because God gave the Ninevites 
time and space to repent, and he knew that they would. And if you are in Christ this evening, it is because God has given you 40 days, so to speak, to repent. God gave you time and space to turn from your wicked ways and save yourself from this crooked and twisted generation. God is so infinitely patient with us and kind towards us. And his kindness is designed to lead us to repentance, Romans chapter 2 says. Praise God that he didn't strike us dead on the spot, but gave us time, as it were, to come to faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for granting the Ninevites repentance. And if anyone be in Christ in this room here this evening, it is because you have done the exact same regenerating work in their heart that you did in the hearts of the Ninevites. God, forbid it, please, that we would grow calloused to that reality. And may you bring a revival in this city through your regenerated people, even in this youth group here, God. Bring about widespread revival through bold preaching and proclamation and loving of people here in Menominee and abroad, just like the revival that was brought in Nineveh. Give us grace now as we head into small groups to discuss these things. We pray in Jesus' name.